joined us. You've reached Hi. SJ Thomason and uh, christian-apologist.com. And I'm super thrilled that I'm to be joined by some amazing Christians. So I've got my friend Andrew, my friend Josh, and my friend Lisa, and they're all here. And we're going to have a super, super interesting conversation. So hold on one second. I just realized I've got my sound on. Okay, so let's let's go ahead and begin. Uh, Andrew, Josh, would you and Lisa, let's just go in that order since I think that's a, similar to the order where you showed up. And uh, if you could just introduce yourselves to, to the audience, that'd be great. Sure thing. Hi, everyone. This is Andrew Stratelides. I uh, do podcasts and Twitter stuff for the Red Pill Religion Project. Um, I'm a high Anglican and uh, uh, a friend of SJ's, and we like to talk about uh, the psychology and philosophy, and those are some of the things that I enjoy. Uh, my formal background in education is mathematics and engineering, though, so I'm just an amateur when it comes to, to these things. Mathematics and engineering. Whew. It's always interesting. I didn't I don't think I knew that. Uh, Josh? Well, it's uh, good to be here. Also, I'm part of Red Pill Religion, too. Um, I'm in the apologetics world with all of y'all, and I'm glad to be here. My specialties are uh, philosophy, history and books. I love to read and just glad to be here to, to discuss with such eminent and good people. Excellent. Thank you, Josh. And Lisa? Hi, yeah, I'm Lisa Quintana. I am a Christian apologist and I blog at thinkdivinely.com. I'm also the vice chair of communications for a ministry called womeninapologetics.com. And SJ is featured on there along with probably about 50 women that are in apologetics now. And so you can go on that website and you can actually just click on a name and you know various blogs and things will come up via that name or even a topic. It's kind of like the hub to go to for women in apologetics. So had to put a plug in there for that one. <laughs> I, you know, I'm really glad you did. And that does bring up something. We don't see as many women writing books in apologetics. And I think we should encourage that. And so um, even in the, the pile of books that I have, and I know Josh does a lot of reading. He just mentioned that. But in the pile of books I have, the vast majority are males. And I I, I don't pick my books by the gender of the author. But but it's it's true that you just don't see as many females out there promoting the good word. Now you do, though womeninapologetics.com. Yes, so she's rounded us up, put us into, <laughs> put us into a, a site. So thank you so much for, for being such a uh, forward thinking person and with respect to our faith. So let's talk about, we, we were mentioning on uh, different topics we talk about, but Andrew mentioned when we first came on here that he'd be interested in talking about moral foundations theory, which is a theory that's proposed by Jonathan Haidt, who's a philosophy professor now up at the Stern School of Business in New York. And uh, he also is part of this heterodox academy. And, uh, and I just joined Heterodox Academy, I have to say, so I'm pretty excited about that. And I'll be going to their annual conference next year. And, uh, and I'm also, as, I, as Lisa said, I'm part of the Women uh, in Apologetics, so I'm really excited about that too. Um, but Jonathan Haidt has this idea where, where he's taken, he surveyed over 30,000 people online and he found that liberals and conservatives actually have different sets of values. Like for example, the liberals tend to focus more on care, harm, or fairness. And conservatives focus on five different foundations instead of only two. Uh, their additional foundations include purity, authoritarian, uh, and, and loyalty. Um, so I, I wanted to just open it up and, and to see what each of you think about that. Sure. Um, so I, I think that that uh, based on the survey data and, and sort of the theory behind it, it seems to, to be a pretty sound um, uh, hypothesis for at least explaining some of the differences we see uh, in in the the way that people lean of, uh, of various clusters of of, of politics um, and uh, the, the, the 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 key things seem to be that conservatives uh, will use authority purity and loyalty as sort of their axioms when determining the morality of an act uh, to a greater extent than left liberals will. Um, and of course, the, these are all just correlations um, rather than 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 uh, destiny, right? There, there are people who uh, have conservative politics uh, that, that 
don't have that or, or will have different moral foundations and so on and so forth but but it, it i guess the the key part is that it shows that there's different moral intuitions that determine how people look at how society should be um organized right and that the different moral intuitions that you emphasize will actually determine what norms you think are just or unjust or reasonable or unreasonable yeah and i think that's a what, what jonathan Haidt says that i that just to build off that is the whole idea of of sanctity or what what do people hold sacred i should say and so if you hold purity sacred, for example, uh, and saying, you know, you would probably be one to say, I, I don't endorse the idea of po polyamorous, polyamorous relationships. Uh, and I found uh, that a lot of people, at least on social media, do endorse polyamorous relationships, which is something like Richard Dawkins endorses it, uh, Richard Carrier endorses it. So uh, not, to, not to out them, but they're, they promote that about themselves. And so I find that super interesting. So um, what do you think about that? I don't, I don't know, that sounds you know, polyamorous you're talking about? So it's this idea that they have this open marriage. Like when people get yeah. married, they might have 10 other partners all at once. And because they're, they tell each other about it, uh, they're both on both sides, they're okay with it. And so a lot of people think, well, that's just perfectly acceptable. <laughs> it's a fancy name for uh, what in the 60s were called swingers. Yeah, and it would be, Andrew, I think perfectly reasonable in their worldview. So if your worldview is strictly naturalism, and you don't think that you know you're going to have anything to you know live for after you die, and you just die, and that's it, and you're here to procreate and have fun, and you know eat, drink, and you know be merry for tomorrow we die. <laughs> you know, if that's your attitude, then I can see why that would not even be an issue. You know, but but if you have an attitude like, wait a minute, you know, there's there's more to life than what meets the eye, then I think that would greatly affect your morals and and what you would embrace and what you wouldn't. And I, I just, just for speaking, I don't know this particular theory that well, but just speaking from my personal experience, I was raised a very liberal Democrat in SoCal, <laughs> where there's a lot of liberal thinking and I was very in, influenced by my culture. And so what ended up happening for me is that once I became a Christian, all of a sudden I realized that, you know, hey, there's different ways of living and this is not necessarily the best way of living. And what I used to think as a liberal Democrat is I used to think, that we were all innately good. And then my worldview changed when I started realizing, wait a minute, if that's true, then why am I getting messed up all the time? <laughs> why are people breaking my heart? Why are people treating me badly? If people are truly innately good, that didn't line up with my reality. And so I, you know, when I, once I became a Christian, then my reality was like, wait a minute, I think people aren't innately good, even though I think I would have liked to have preferred to believe that. <laughs> because we all want to think we're innately good, right? So I think that this is where morals really kind of ground themselves in, in not not objectively, but personally. So if you if you if you have a moral system that's based on, hey, people are gonna do the right thing given the given the chance, they'll do the right thing. Or wait a minute, maybe they won't. <laughs> maybe we need to have a moral system set up knowing that people may not do the right thing given the chance. I mean, most of the time you want to think that we would, and I think, uh, and a lot of times we do, but if we didn't have laws, I mean, why, why do we even have laws, right? We have laws because people steal, people do stupid stuff. <laughs> so to me, that, that, that's kind of the crux of it, even though I don't know this particular theory, but I think, you know, it's basically it, it all stems in your, in your worldview and what you think, you know, what, what would motivate you? Yeah, you know, I was raised a Republican and then my parents became Democrats and then I changed and became a Democrat. And now I'm kind of leaning in the middle. I've, I've actually gone back to the middle because I don't like the way the Democrats are, are running things right now. <laughs> Some of them are oh, too I'm far not, to the left. They, they're, well, the I'm things they're coming up with are ridiculous. And I'm not a card carrying Republican either. I want you to know that. <laughs> I am registered independent because I feel like there's certain things that I just I can't embrace on either side. You know, so so the way I shape my my voting or, or political values is really from a biblical worldview. So so that's where I come. You know, so that's why I figure out. You know what? I'll just register as independent, and I'll I'll see what happens <laughs> with the candidates. You know. So, anyways, I think I think one thing that is important. And I think you focused on this, Lisa, is that without God, you know, 
all is permissible. This is what Dostoevsky said. Exactly. Uh, without God, all, all is permissible. And we're all going to serve some type of sacred, some, some type of sacred thing that's at the top of our, our hierarchy, which would be a God substitute. Uh, I often post on Facebook, you know, atheists serve the gods of love, uh, uh, excuse me, of sex, money, or power, or fame. And it's true. If you do not have God, you're going to try to make a God in your own particular idiosyncratic image. So right. that's why I think having God or the at, at the top of our, our hi hierarchy is, you know, so important. So these worldview type questions, mm -hmm. it's it's so important uh, in today's society. Yeah, and and uh, to to channel Jordan Peterson a little bit for for the the members of the audience that don't necessarily believe in God, um, the idea of God that we have in our minds is, at least if from sort of a human perspective, the aggregate of all sacred valuable things, and so if you if you start sort of from an empirical standpoint of of your experiences of what right and wrong is and the sacred and the profane is and if you aggregate those and symbolically combine those that is part of what god is or or at least our idea of god and and of course uh, we christians believe that that god has ultimate reality to it but but even if you don't believe in God, you can start understanding religion by looking at it as the system of sacred things and the highest sacred thing or the aggregate of all the sacred things is the idea of God. That's good. Yeah, I like I like Jordan Peterson. He's he's kind of interesting because I almost feel like he's coming around. In, in his last interview that I just heard that he he uh, broadcasted from um, Prager University. I think it was Prager. He he mentioned something like uh, he always says he lives as if there's a God, but he went a little bit farther that time. And I'm forgetting exactly how he put it. But I thought to myself, I think you're coming around, Jordan. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, getting back to that living as if there's a God, I, I often bring this up too, and, it, and it, it's certainly true. Western society, society as we know it, was shaped by a broadly conceived Judeo-Christian understanding of God uh, from the, uh, the sciences to the uh, university system to education to the first hospitals to so many things, the abolishment of slavery twice. I teach history and I go through all of this. Um, the, it, it is true. The atheist does live as if Christianity were true and as if God was a living reality. Um, so if they're living a good and honest uh, life, uh, obeying the law and so forth, and even though they profess atheism by their words, they live as though God does exist. So if that's true, and I think all indications uh, show that it is true, you know, I just welcome atheists to come back to God. Um, I think they'll find a, a welcome place in the church. Yeah, I think we should. Um, a, a couple people in the audience are mentioning capitalism. So I wanted to see if, if anyone would like to share your opinions on capitalism. I'm a, a huge proponent of capitalism. I think it's awesome. It's private ownership. And, and uh, it's the idea to me that spurs innovation, creativity and entrepreneurship. And I think that it's actually lifted civilization that Josh could probably talk to is lifted civilization out of poverty. Uh, if we go back the past couple of hundred years, all of the capitalist Western societies basically have led the led the way for a lot of Eastern societies now to endorse capitalistic practices. And, and we're starting to see since China's opening up a little bit more and India opened up in 1991, we've got a growing burgeoning middle class in these parts of the world that we would have never had without uh, the idea of granting private in individuals property rights. So I wanted to see, what do you you three think about capitalism? Uh, okay, well, uh, I'll probably be the the um, 
devil's advocate. Um, and and part of the issue is capitalism is actually a, a Marxist term. And so it ends up being uh, basically a catch-all for everything from like a anarcho-capitalist society where there are no rules but only contracts and everyone's ruled by judges to any system where uh, you have the rights to the fruits of your own labor to anything that isn't socialist. Um, and so I guess the, the, the key things for me is we have to divide up what what are we talking about exactly. Um, and uh, my, my general principle is that economics is subordinate to ethics as a science. And so um, there are some people who uh, are proponents of capitalism that basically claim that a capitalism or, or the system that they advocate, which is usually a laissez-faire capitalism where there is no regulation except enforcement of contracts, will lead to just outcomes and that that's what the definition of a just outcome is. Um, I disagree with that, uh, that the key things for me in a system are um, the keeping our natural rights intact, which include things like the rights to the fruits of your own labor, uh, private property rights, um, and, and uh, those types of things. Also, to distribute the means of production as broadly as possible. Um, the, 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 the pithy sort of thing from Chesterton is, I, I love private property, and I think everyone should have some. Um, <laughs> I like and, that. Yeah, and so that's sort of the, the, the key tension I have with the American system, which which is better than centralized systems, but uh, not everyone in America owns the means of their own production, right? And and that that's that I think is an injustice. Um, the other thing that that I dislike about our system is uh, what are called um, full recourse lending. So full recourse lending is, for example, let's say you buy a house for five hundred thousand dollars, and that's what what the cost is. And let's say the housing market crashes, right? And now it's only worth one hundred thousand dollars you personally are actually still on the hook for that five hundred thousand dollar loan even though the uh, value of the real asset has diminished um, and I think that's uh, an injustice and in that that we have to be careful especially with lending uh, because there's a transfer of risk from uh, the lender to the lendee, and and oftentimes these types of full recourse lending um, have a significant asymmetry to the point that it's unjust. You know, I'm I'm actually as a former realtor, I'm a I'm a fine with the idea that the uh, the bank basically should is you made the loan for five hundred thousand dollars. The bank uh, is owed five hundred thousand dollars to me. That's that's my counter opinion. So, um, so I, you know, I, we could talk about that. But I think one of the problems that came about with the crash of the housing market uh, was because banks were giving loans out way too freely, and it was because they weren't held responsible. They would give out these subprime loans, uh, then they would securitize it and collateralize it and send it off to another financial institution. That financial institution would buy insurance from AIG and uh, eliminate the risk for themselves. And so a lot of these uh, subprime mortgages finally collapsed and people had hedged their bets that that would happen. And that's part of the reason why the housing market collapsed. But I also think that people who take those loans are just as responsible as the banks for what happened. So if you if you can't afford it, you're taking a no income verification loan, you cannot afford a $500,000 house. Uh, you should not be buying a $500,000 house. That's how I would say. Well, I like what Andrew said earlier too about um when we decide all these things, what is the grounding in that? Again, it should be ethical. What's the ethical standard first? And so I would guess the person asked you about capitalism primarily because they're trying to figure out, well, how does Christianity, you know, see that? Because I, I hear all the time, you know, like right now, you know, Marxism, socialism, that's all on the, on the table and people are talking about that in universities. And, you know, I see the Christian conservatives saying, oh my gosh, you know, don't go down that road, you know, socialism and Marxism. And yet then I hear other people say, well, Acts 242, they were like, you know, selling and buying and sharing everything kind of like socialism. So where does Christianity fall within that? And how does Christianity then embrace, you know, capitalism or does it? So yeah, I, I, that, that's what I'm thinking this person might be asking. 
is maybe, you know, is, is, is it Christian to be capitalism? You know, and I think you're you're bringing up something that we have the elephant in the room here <laughs> that 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 we knew, do need to speak to the the uh, argument against capitalism is that there are greedy capitalists, and I'll I'll fully acknowledge that some of these CEOs are making a, egregious amounts of money relative to the average worker. In fact, I've done calculations; a lot of them make around 400 times the average workers. So so that's a, a greedy element that that I think that a lot of people are against, and that's part of the reason why capitalism gets a bad name. I agree. I mean, that that's one of the reasons why, I mean, I think the systems that we have in the world, of all the systems we have, capitalism is probably, probably the best, um, but it needs to have some sort of, you know, regulations to, to avoid, like what you said about the CEOs and the and the greed, because, because we are innately sinful, even though that's not politically correct to say. <laughs> I mean, well, we are innately sinful, and, the, and so we're always going to have, you know, if we don't have some type of caps on these things and some sort of ethical regulations, then we will. I mean, you know, we exploit that kind of stuff. So I think that's, I think for me that, that's what, you know, Christianity, I think capitalism is probably the best system, but you can't have it just go rampant. You have to have some, some regulation in there a little bit. You can't just have it go, what, what you know, like, I think it was, uh, oh, that, uh, I, I don't remember his name, but somebody said that they, they pretty much before the 2008 crash, they thought the market would would carry itself, that the market would just take care of itself. They were just kind of let, they took off the regulations, they let things go, and <laughs> we ended up in a mess because they didn't account for greed. They didn't account for the, those types of actions. Yeah, I'm not sure if greed was uh, what prolonged it rather than uh, something that the Austrian School of Economics has argued is that the federal-backed, um, um, the money that you put in the banks, that it will be automatically uh, federally protected, where that the government will supply the banks and, and bail them out, you know, so that they can bail the people out or help to give, give the people their money or uh, ensure up to a, a certain level of uh, a certain amount of money. That gives people the... Um, the chance to take undue, unnecessary risk that a free market left to itself would never uh, would never do that. This is what um, Murray Rothbard ha has argued in some of his books. Yeah, Andrew, yeah. I want to. I didn't I, see. I disagreed with Andrew on that one point, but I definitely would like to hear more of what he thinks. On this sure, too. sure. Uh, so, so uh, one of the key things, um, and and I think this is in accord with Christian teaching, is that there's nothing wrong per se with uh, an executive earning four hundred thousand dollars or four hundred times that of a normal worker. The issue uh, from from the Christian ethical perspective is who takes on the risk. Um, one of the key problems with our current system is that executives of large companies tend to have a free option um, in the way that they're set up so that they don't have to deal with the long-term consequences of poor decisions that they make. Um, oftentimes they are basically incentivized to increase the stock price over the next quarter or over the next year, and there are no clawbacks that, that will bite them if the choices they made screw the company over and it goes bankrupt in three years. Um, and so I think that's one of the key ethical issues. The other, uh, with the 2008 banking, is basically uh, the banks screwed up and then got... Uh, bailed out by the government with no consequences and the 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 they basically end up being able to use a free market winner take all system for who gets the money or who gets the bonuses and then when they screw up society has to pay the price and uh, i'm fine with them uh being able to take the the, the rewards uh in a winner-take-all system, the such way, if they also take the the punishments or the downsides in a winner-take-all way, and, and basically the 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 correct answer I think is from Nassim Taleb on this that if 
a bank wants to get bailed out. They can be, but then they get run like a government utility and there are no performance bonuses and everyone gets paid the same as the civil servant at the same level. And so it's like, if you want to be treated as though you are a part of the government or like the U.S. military or police or something where it's like, we will have this because we need it to live, then you're going to be treated that way 100%. You're not going to be able to get... Um, you're, you're not going to be able to pass on the downsides to society and keep the upsides to yourself. Um, and uh, the, the, the key sort of thing that capitalism does better than Marxism, and by capitalism I mean primarily free market economies where there is not a central plan of how things are done versus centralized planning of economic systems is it it reduces or eliminates the people uh, the ability of greedy people to harm the system um, a greedy person who follow the follows the rules in uh, capitalism uh, will be encouraged to create value for others well that is not the, uh, true in centralized planning systems. So that that is one advantage of market economies over centralized planned systems. And and uh, I'm really sympathetic to to some of these these Marxists who point out the injustices inherent in the system. The 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 fundamental issue is though that they're not articulating articulating an alternative. They're just saying we should tear it down and things will be better. Um, but that's not the case. It will be much worse if we tear down the current system unless we have a clear understanding of what we need to put in its place. Um, one thing you're talking about, Andrew, is you're talking about the economic calculation problem, where under, under Marxism, there's simply no way for a central planning office to do all the central planning and, and distribution of goods and so forth, all these transactions in a in a in an economy that would require of a of a central banking system. This is one of the things that Hayek pointed out. Um, so again, I think the invisible hand, or as uh, as I also think it's known as uh, theology working in the free exchange of goods or, or of money. That's why I think um, Marxists are, are so adamantly opposed to Adam Smith's The Invisible Hand because they want to be able to verify anything by, um, you know, by calculation, by centralized planning. That they, they don't understand that, that uh, by, without any constraints on it, um, everything will take care of itself by and large under a free market economy without a centrally plan, uh, a planned administration taking care of everything as if they could in the first place. Yeah, and and the, the, the key thing I point out is that one of Adam Smith's assumptions is that the market the markets are made up of owner operated act uh, owner operated firms who are roughly of the same competence and size and as long as those constraints are met the, the markets can be extremely efficient at, at those types of things and and I'll also point out that this this sort of central planning fallacy is, is um, very common not only in people who advocate for socialism but people who are neoliberal who advocate for globalism as well that they think that by having a high level plan for the world that they're going to be able to to markedly make things better than than something that's more grassroots or or um, respects the rights of the local over the global yeah and i think i, I you've all brought up some really good points i wanted to um I see a question here from Brian Stevens, so it's going to kind of switch gears slightly, but I wanted to get to this question because I think it's uh, pretty important. He wants to know what each of you think is the best evidence for Christianity, the Christian God. Um, if, if I can go first, I, I like to frame it um, as a cumulative case. I never give any of the pieces of evidence alone. 
and I, I gave this analogy, well, I've given this analogy in many of my debates, but as, um, as uh, a medieval knight that would wear chain mail uh, in all the links of, uh, in, the, in the chain mail are pieces of evidence and held together by different links. So I think the, the, the way and the fact that they're held together with other types of arguments is um, best construed as like a, in a cum cumulative case, not in isolation of one another. So I think um, I think it's well. Pick out pick out one of them that you think would be the strongest, because then I'll have each of you mention that, and then maybe we, you can come back and and uh, weave them all together. Okay, let me think about that. I, I can go. While you're yeah. thinking, Josh, <laughs> I definitely think it's the resurrection. Absolutely, the resurrection, because. Of all the world's religions, no other uh, religious leader died and rose again and had like hundreds of people seeing that. <laughs> so to me, that's the key. So, you know, then you have to go into the argument and Josh, you might bring this up. Then you have to go into the argument. Well, are the historical, you know, documents we have for that event reliable? And then you'd have to go into that argument. So first, I think it's, it's the resurrection. I mean, that you know, Jesus resurrected. And there's a lot of evidence for that. But then you have to go and look in the historical documents and know how those are validated and all that kind of stuff. But one thing that, you know, I don't hear a lot, um, just personally, I mean, for me, I wasn't a Christian until I was 25 years old. And when I came to God, it was through people telling me about him. And at first I rejected it. I was like, you know what? Old fashioned, heard that, not, not interested. <laughs> You know, I was just like, uh, uh, no, but but it was God using people to continually, you know, enter into my life and tell me things about Jesus. And then finally, I was able to say, OK, you know what? I'll give it a shot. I'm going to look into this, you know, but it, but it was because God used people. And so that's another thing that that I think is important is that, is that God, through his spirit, sovereignly uses people and things so sovereignly work out. You know, and of course, that's an, an issue of faith. And you can say, well, it's coincidence, blah, 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 <laughs> or whatever. But to me, you know, it was a sovereign act of God in my personal life that brought me to Christianity. And then it was a nice to know that, oh, gosh, it actually has a lot of evidence to back it up as well. So. Good. So uh, I'll go ahead and go. Uh, the, the two key things that Christianity answers better than any other system that I've investigated, and I've investigated quite a few, are the, the question of uh, what's called natural theology or general revelation, which is integrating all the knowledge we have of the world through human reason and com uh, comprehending that into a metaphysically consistent worldview and the answer to the various paradoxes of man. So by, by that, I mean the, the, the spiritual anthropology, the, an explanation of what it means to be human in Christianity that is um, complete and uh, complete and answers the paradoxes that no other system does, right? So uh, some of the examples are um, uh, we aren't inherently good, but at the same time, we inherently know what the good is. So that that's explained by uh, original sin, right? That, that we were made to be good, but we have this untold ontological wound upon our being and that this and this ties into everything we're both individuals right and we exist in community and both of these are fundamental to the human existence and and so on and so forth and christianity uh answers this uh explicitly in christ who um both as an as an individual sacrificed himself for the salvation of all and and tied the transcendent to the eminent or tied god to man and 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 solved this paradox not just in an intellectual manner but a spiritual manner so uh the, that's the the two key uh supports for my knowledge of Christianity being true, that that it has the best understanding of all of human reason and spiritual um, experience, and then it answers the question of what it means to be human in the most complete and uh, precise way.
Okay, you want to go to Josh? Thank you, both of you. These are fascinating reasons, and and I, I think uh, I'll have to agree with both of them. <laughs> I think they're both very good reasons. Uh, there's the typical reasons people talk about, like the cosmological argument or the teleological and purpose idea, or there's the moral argument, which I think uh, Andrew was touching on just a little bit of that. Uh, um, I think that they're all very strong. So let me turn it back to Josh to to weave these all together. <laughs> Well, um, at, at the beginning, I was trying to argue that it's best construed the the evidence of Christianity, which which I've investigated too, is best construed, in my opinion, as an accumulative case, and it's very hard to isolate or give a particular um, uh, particular instance uh, or an argument for that that is the best. Uh, what I would do uh, is try to point out the multifaceted nature of the case and, and piggyback on Andrew, what Andrew said, um, it, it's almost like we can conceptualize um, a thousand um, angled uh, shape um, uh, or a cube with a thousand different angles on it, where there are many ways to look at this and, and many ways to grow. So I don't think it's, it's just the evidence, but it's also the other side of the coin um, where, where it shows that there's a church where a person um, can, can grow that existential factor, that necessary part of our existence where we can grow and look to the church, uh, an instance where Jesus, um, you know, prophesied and, and established a, a church and an ever present reality to him. So a miracle like the resurrection without a context, um, you know, maybe David Hume's, uh, uh, you know, rhetoric might, might have a little something to it if it wasn't for the overall context in which Jesus uh, lived and, and had his being on earth. So his overall ministry in establishing the church uh in conjunction with the facts of the resurrection, I think that is an impenetrable case um, that I think cannot be broken. Yeah, let me let me piggyback on what each of you said. Actually, I, I want to first highlight something Lisa said that I think is important. I think each of us have have taken our own path to find God and to identify the Christian God. And, and like Lisa, I also spent about 20 years doubting uh, the Christian God. I, I thought for sure that Eastern faiths were more, they were superior, they were more interesting, they were more exotic. And so I thought that that they were real. And then about seven years ago, God started making himself very known in my life. And I realized we have a personal relationship with God. So it's, it's not this impersonal pantheistic sort of idea that, that the Eastern faiths endorse. Uh, he's, he has made himself very, very evident and personal. And like Lisa said, he works through people to do that. Like I bumped into a pastor on a plane who convinced me to go read Mere Christianity and I had never read anything by C.S. Lewis. And then the trilemma to me was the game changer. Uh, I, I love the trilemma. And then I just couldn't get enough. I started you know, going to this church. I started really doing a lot of different things. I started cleaning up some aspects of my life, realizing you know, I could be nicer to people. And so, uh, so he keeps working through me, trying to make me better. And I, I think by the grace of God, I, I don't even understand how I'm even worthy, but, but thankfully I don't, it's not by my acts, it's by my faith that, that we're called in. You know, all those other arguments are really terrific and, and good, but I think what you, what you nailed it, it's like Jesus makes it personal. And you know, you can have the cosmological argument, the moral argument, that, that only tells you that God exists. That only gives you, but it doesn't tell you then which religion, and then sort of to uh, piggyback on what Andrew said, which religion has the solution to the human problem? And the human problem is we mess up all the time. <laughs> you know, and it's like okay, so Christianity talks about that, and it, and it specifically, you know, like like other religions, and I'm not I'm not a world religions expert, but other religions, from what I can see, try to like negate that or you know suffering is an illusion let's just put that away you know it's like no suffering's real man it's like not an illusion and so to me it's like you know christianity addresses that with sin you know and then christ came for sin so so christianity not only you know has the resurrection but it has 
the, the, the solution to the human condition. So that's kind of like, I think that's what you were saying, Andrew, earlier. It's like, it, it does, it, it has this great philosophical depth to it. Yeah, exactly. And um, as you all have been saying, there are many doors uh, to enter the church and uh, the reason is God reaches us all where we're at um, and th there there are things that are in common and and sort of that we can intellectually examine but but really and th th uh, this shows my background and I think it's a very Christian way to look at it there's an existential um, reality to the Christian faith that is beyond just the 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 intellectual aspects and and that they marry together very well but but uh, the, it it's that sort of spiritual existential connection that 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 is the root of it or the trunk of it yeah absolutely the uh, the multifaceted the spiritual um, you know I, I look at the Bible and, you know, these words on the paper, you can't just look at the words. You have to reflect on it. Um, you have to read it and let it make it grow you also. Be open to that possibility. Um, just as God is the most powerful being in the world, there are many things to the Bible where it can transform a person. And it's and throughout history, it's transformed the most stubborn atheist into the most ardent uh, defender of the faith. I'm, I'm thinking of C.S. Lewis right here, but there's a plethora more that we could be that could be named. So it's you know, it's not just based on the historical evidence or this or that piece of evidence. It's the multifaceted, uh, which Andrew emphasized and which all of us have you know, have said in some way, but it's, it's also the way, in my opinion, the way it, you can grow from it and the, the establishment of the church, the ever presence uh, of the, of Kierkegaard said, the presence uh, of Jesus is uh, contemporaneous with us still to this day. Um, so I think, you know, I'll, I often say there's no good reason to be a skeptic and there's many reasons to place your whole life and whole being into the Christian faith. Yeah, let me let me uh, piggyback on that a little bit because I think I think all of you have made such very interesting and, and intellectual points. Uh, so I, I definitely appreciate that. But I want to point out something that is, I think is really important that people need to know about Christianity itself, and that is we're a uh, faith where just basically John 3.16 is. So for those who, uh, for God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son so that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. That statement itself is, is groundbreaking because it goes completely against Islam, for example, where uh, your works are what determines whether or not you're going to make it to heaven. And none of us are, are sin free. Christianity tells us, hey, we for all fall short of the glory of God. And so, so we have this faith where uh, God realizes the human condition and accepts us anyway. Thank God. <laughs> well, I, I want to just mention, um, Josh, I think sometimes people can read the Bible and completely not get it and chuck it. My my, my brother did that. He's a scientist. And so I, I think um, he went to the Bible. He read it with a prove it to me attitude and I don't, I don't think that that's something that God honors. I, you know, everything I read about, you know, God and his interaction with humanity, he wants us to be humble. He wants us to recognize he's the source of it all. And, you know, when we don't have that attitude, and I, you know, I don't, I don't know exactly if my brother had that attitude, but I know that he was, he was interested in a Christian girl and he figured, well, I'm going to read this Bible and try to figure out why, you know, but it wasn't like, I'm going to read this Bible because I'm open and seeking God. You know, it was like, I'm trying to figure out what, what, how to get this Christian girl, you know? <laughs> so I think sometimes, you know, there is an element of, you know, there's certain people just can't, they can't wrap their brains around faith. They, they want evidence. They want proof. They want to know that they know that they know without a shadow of a doubt. And that's not what God has asked us to do. He gives us enough faith or enough evidence, I, I should say, 
to, to make that step of faith. But there is a step. There's a little bit of a step you have to take. And I think that that's where I found atheists do not like. They do. They want so much God to just like manifest himself right in front of their, their face or, or, you know, perform for them or show them something right then and there when they ask for it. And I, I don't think that that's something that, that uh, is an honoring aspect of seeking God with a real true desire to know whether or not it's true. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, yeah. Uh, absolutely. And I, I think that's the problem where um, a lot of these people on Twitter come with one year of uh, college uh, philosophy. Uh, a little bit of philosophy, you, you, you really need to engulf oneself in philosophy uh, and, and not just accept an uncritical view of, of what skepticism is um, or, or trying to seek certainty as in a Descartes, Descartian type right. of way. But that's why I, I always bring up um, probably my favorite philosopher, Thomas Reed, who said we can know God intuitively um, by reflection and uh you know, with a humble heart, it's just sometimes philosophy gets in the way where we, where we make, where we um, uh, use philosophy in a bad way and a way it was never meant to be used. Um, uh, we use science in a bad way, uh, in a verificationist type way that says only the five senses can give us reliable knowledge or, or that only the material world exists. When we humbly step back and, and say, you know, all of these things can only make sense with trust and humility. Then I think you're right that if we come to the Bible that way with an open heart and an open mind, we can, you know, glean what it's trying to say. Yeah. Andrew? I oh, yeah. Well, I was just going to say that um, <clears throat> there, there are a couple things that that one um the the bible is designed and was written uh for people in the church to use already so that it's not very effective for someone who is incredulous of the the, the claims of christianity um it is not not very surprising right it's sort of like uh giving someone uh, advanced medical text and they're like, I, I want you to prove that, that Western medicine works through this advanced text. And they read it and wouldn't comprehend anything in it. Um, and, and, and I think that's part of the, the, the issue that some of these atheists have is that they're uh, not looking at it the right way or they're not being guided in the right way. And um, the, the, I, I think you're exactly right that there is a leap that you have to make, but there's a leap in everything, right? To, to get yeah. married to a person that you don't know perfectly requires a leap. To 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 take any action in reality takes a leap, and the the leap in Christianity, if you're properly prepared, is a lot smaller than people realize but there is always a leap to any existential question including the god question or the christ question right absolutely yeah i agree with that so um so so i think you've come up with a lot of good answers i wanted to uh, a few since all of you mentioned the bible i wanted to point something out in case people in the audience don't know this but uh, if people don't know the bible was written by over 30 authors over 1500 years in three languages and three continents. And the Old Testament quite consistently points to the New Testament. And uh, the angel of the Lord mentioned in the Old Testament numerous times uh, is likely Jesus. And uh, Isaiah 53, uh, prophecy, Jesus resurrection, Psalm 22 did as well. Uh, Daniel 9 actually gives us specific timing. Uh, so we know the, the date in 33 when Jesus was crucified. That's was uh, prophesied in Daniel uh, years before, hundreds of years before. And uh, and so there's some pretty good evidence right in the Bible uh, for, I know it sounds, people say, well, there's evidence in the Bible for the Bible. But if you think about the Jews in, in early Christian history, they had no expectations that Jesus was going to be nailed on a cross. This was not the sort of Messiah that they had uh, thought was going to be coming. So it's it's pretty interesting just to look at that as a as a reason. Yeah, and and I mean, if you look at Isaiah, it's very haunting how 
explicit it seems it is of a prophecy of Christ and his crucifixion and and even resurrection um, and you know it, it's sort of interesting to to talk to pious Jews about these things and there's there's some confusion that 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 people have and they don't actually realize that the Christian interpretive tradition is actually descended from the Pharisees um, and that the majority of the, the Hebrew converts to Christianity were Pharisees um, and that that in that sense we actually have a resonance with rabbinical Judaism which is also based on the Pharisaic tradition um, and uh, it, it's and th this is another great one uh if the uh parting of the red sea did not occur that means that basically a lie can put itself into the root of human consciousness for thousands of years and not be pull pulled up and if that's the case that means that we can't be certain of anything that that that's historical that 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 were uh, incredibly credulous and gullible and that in some sense there's no uh, chance of us ever knowing the truth and you know some people some people are willing to buy that bullet but that means that the the atheist can no longer claim to be on the side of truth because the truth is not graspable through the, through human knowledge that's extremely popular nowadays, <laughs> I think, you know, with, with you know, post-truth, post-relativism. I mean, people are saying, you know, well, that's your truth, Andrew. <laughs> you know, I mean, so I think people have embraced that, actually. Yeah, I, I think you're right. And the, the sad thing is, is that devolves into who's the mightiest, right? And and my response usually to someone that says truth is relative or moral is, is relative uh, is, thanks for letting me know. I'll be sure to become mighty because that's the only thing you will obey. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, a lot of professional philosophers, um, I've been noticing like uh, Dr. Graham Oppie or Quinton Smith or... Um, you know, uh, Tim, uh, 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 Tim Crane, some of these professional philosophers we've been dialoguing with, me and Andrew, they don't act like these philosophers, these professional atheists on Twitter uh, or the, you know, the Dan Barker types. They, they, they come to it in a more scholarly fashion and, and they don't get, let the relativism or, or, or unjustified skepticism get, get to them in their their scholarship sometimes it does creep in for example with a, a bart ehrman but you have even demonstrated this sj and bart ehrman has even said to this about his old uh, mentor bruce mesner when he goes into the text none of uh his skepticism or or what he thinks that uh the you know the textual uh difficulties in the biblical text say anything that contradicts any doctrine of the New Testament. And he says, what are you talking about? We can still get the, uh, or, or understand what the New Testament says. He said this in one of his editions of, uh, I forgot the name of the book, uh, SJ. Uh, what yeah, his second it? edition of Misquoting Jesus. Okay. And, and unfortunately it's been taken out of the edition, the, the third edition, <laughs> so, yeah. so it's hard to find. Well, see, he probably took that out because it, it probably helped him sell sell books. Let's be honest. And he probably took that out to give this sensationalistic uh, uh, look or, or um, uh, view that you know we can know nothing of the Bible, and that's not what Good Bart says in that second edition. Well, yeah, I like that bad Bart and good Bart. I think that's how Bill um, <laughs> William Lane Craig actually refers to him. But doesn't doesn't Bart eventually get to the point where he is he's he confesses that it's a problem of evil is why he's rejected Christianity and, and God in general. I mean he had he has a, a probably a, a you know an issue with with something that happened maybe to his life or just all this all the suffering he sees and he can't reconcile that with a good God. That's actually so we should probably go into that. What do you think are the best arguments that atheists give against God existing? Is it is a problem of evil pretty much the number one? Do you feel? I 
I've really been considering this with all of our discussions, Andrew and Lisa um, and SJ. I've, I've been dealing with this. I think the problem of evil is their best argument, but I don't think it's a good argument, and I don't think any of their arguments are, are good. That That's my viewpoint. Uh, yeah, well, uh, I, I'd say the argument from evil has a lot of emotional force. It doesn't have very much logical force. Um, and the, the basically the key thing is that Elvin Plantinga showed that belief in God is properly basic and that, that in some sense it can come directly from our spiritual ex experience and there hasn't been a good argument against that uh, that I know of that doesn't refute like human's ability to know things um, like in like a general case, right? That 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 the, all the things that I've seen brought against that are that we can't know things at all. Like we can't even know the laws of physics, really. Um, and so, I would say that the best argument against it would be a strong, extremely strong doubt in the, the, the ability of man to know truth, or of, of humans to know truth. And that would be the, the strongest uh, argument against theism that I know of. Well, to me, it seems like, you know, common sense is not real popular these days. <laughs> to me, it's like, it's just common sense. Some of this stuff is common sense. You know, you just have this innate knowing, you know, and common sense says, there is evil, but if you have evil, how can you even, you know, I mean, how can you have evil if you don't have goodness? And where is that goodness grounded? You know, I mean, C.S. Lewis alluded to, to you know, how are you going to know the sh shadows without the sun? You know, I mean, these these are the kind of things. To, to me, it's just common sense. And I feel like um, that common sense has been, like, replaced with, <laughs> with all this other stuff, you know. And I think that, you know, there is an innate sense that we all have. And I think sometimes we negate that or we, we try to, you know, philosophize that away, you know, or we, we have problems with emotional issues or something like that. But I think that if you really look at stuff just with a, 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 as clear a lens as you have, you know, common sense will tell you that this, this is, you know, this world isn't just here by accident. <laughs> there is a reason behind it all. You know, and I think that that's why, you know, the majority of the world's population has some type of belief in a higher power. I think because that that's that common sense. That's that, that you know, we're made in God's image. That's where that comes from, I believe. So the problem of evil, I think, is really, it's the hardest thing, personally, because there is a lot of suffering and there's a lot of people hurting. And I, I mean, I hate that. You know, I wish, I wish it could be heaven right now. But what, what I see, and, and the bigger meta-narrative of this whole thing is that God is working that out. He's redeeming, you know, he's, all this is about redemption, you know, and, and uh, you had mentioned um, Alvin Plantiga, he talks about free will. And to me, that that's a, the best argument, I think, for why there is evil, because there is free will. God, when God created us in his image, he created us with free will. And so he's working all this stuff out and he's working amongst our free will for his ultimate will. And that is ultimately that he wants people to be in heaven with him, where, where we will have a utopian experience. There will be, be no more pain and no more suffering. And I think that that's where all of this is headed. And if the atheistic worldview is true, then you suffer and you, and you die and it's for nothing. At least with Christianity, you suffer and you, and, you, and you possibly learn from it, even though sometimes I think the lessons are pretty hard, right? But at least you know you're going somewhere. There's, it's, it's for a purpose. It's not just for nothing. And to me, that, that, that's a very compelling reason to, to believe, I think. Yeah, I think, I think these are all compelling reasons to believe. And I, I wanted to, Brian Stevens just asked another question that's kind of building off of what you just said. He wants to know, uh, you said that if evil exists, the counter to that is love. Now, is there love and goodness only in heaven without evil? He wants to know if, uh, if there's no evil in heaven, how can there be this, this goodness and love? Because love, love is not... Uh, a condition that evil is a, is a privation of love. Evil is, is something that can't exist on its own. You have to have goodness. You can have goodness on its own. It's like um, the analogy of rust to a car, 
right? You can have a car, but can you have rust by itself? No, rust is a corruption of the car or a wound, right? A wound on your arm. You, you can't have a wound by itself. A wound is a corruption of something. So you can have you can have goodness and you can have love and you can have beauty and truth and all those things. You don't need evil. Evil can't exist actually without these things. Evil on itself can't even exist. So it's, it's a privation of good. Does that make sense? That makes sense. And that sounds similar to what C.S. Lewis said in Mere Christianity. Yeah. And also, let me just add, for some of these questions, even if we don't know that the answer, it, what the answer is, like as in heaven, as in what we'll be able to do or how we'll be able to do it, we only have to give good arguments for Christianity um, and, and know that there are answers to the, some of these other questions that, uh, that the skeptic can raise about what, what our abilities will be like in heaven. So even if we don't have the answer, we have enough to be confident that God raised Jesus from the dead and therefore we have good reasons for what we believe. Let me uh, let me just quick ask this before I, I lose the question, but a utopia buster saying, is there evil in hell? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, isn't that isn't that the definition of hell? Uh, well, I have a slightly different perspective. I would say that hell is where the, uh, stubborn evil is finally defeated. So, uh, and, and it's, it's a hard question, actually, because uh, God is not in, defeated in the end. Nothing that God wills is impeded at the end of things. And, but hell is the state of the human rejection of God when God is triumphant. So, uh, that, that there, I would say that there is no evil left in hell because it is fully and completely uh, punished and, and, and eliminated in that way. So, um, yeah. You know, I want to mention something that Hugh Ross mentioned, and uh, he and I haven't found the passage in Revelation, but he uh, alludes to a passage in Revelation where he says that in hell, people will be restrained, that the hell is being around all of these other people in hell. <laughs> so, so he said, and then they're restrained from each other, apparently, according to a passage in, in Revelation that I haven't found yet. But, uh, but he said that they're like held back from doing the harm that they want to do to each other. <laughs> Oh my God. And I, I think, think Twitter can be a microcosm of hell. I think we're seeing some of the interactions that, that are probably going to be. <laughs> you just stole my line, kind of, SJ. I was going to say hell is uh, um, looking and trying to dissect some of these atheistic, uh, silly arguments on Twitter. <laughs> Well, they've kind of, their community has kind of imploded a little bit with this whole uh, rationality rules case. I don't know if you caught that. What happened with that? Well, Rationality Rules made a video on uh, trans women in sports, wow. and uh, and he was basically vocalizing a position against trans women in sports. And then he got on the atheist community of Austin. He went to the Faithless Forum, and he was involved on their show, uh, The Atheist Experience. And then what happened was they, the Atheist Experience, decided to put put out a Facebook post where they basically said they were against what Rationality Rules did, and they called him a transphobe. And, uh, and then on Twitter, all of the people in support of the trans community versus all of the people uh, against this idea of trans women in sports just started duking it out. And wow. so it's been going on for a few weeks now. And it's it's just a fascinating, <laughs> it's fascinating threads to follow on this stuff. Well, social media is probably not the best forum for rational discussion to begin with, I think, because people can say all kinds. Of, I mean, I've had so many people say terrible things to me on social media and, and you know, I think when you can't see somebody face to face and interact with them, it's easy to be that way and, you know, have a little Twitter fight or whatever you want to call it. But oh, Well, and, and I'll say then that it seems the atheist communities actually tend towards this behavior more because um, they're only united by a negation. They all want to get away from religion or destroy religion or, or whatever. And then when you start talking about other things or positive things like, you know, who's allowed to compete against uh, biological women in sports, then surprise, surprise, they don't all agree with that because they don't have a positive transcendent ideal that they're aiming at together.
Um, and, and I mean, we, we have disagreements in the Christian community as well, but we're all unified in, in the way we're pointing as opposed to being all unified in pointing against something. Yeah, yeah, that's a we, that's a good position, and I should probably clarify for just for the audience. There, there are atheists, and then there are some who call themselves anti-theists, and I think the anti-theists are the ones who who tend to want to destroy religion. Yeah, well, and, maybe even and more part so. Of the issue, yeah, and part of the issue is these anti-theistic and anti-religious um, forces are trying to co-opt the term atheist. I mean, it's not called the. the the, the the anti theist alliance. It's the atheist alliance, even though they're extremely anti religious, and and they are trying to co opt the thing, same thing with agnosticism. Right, that agnosticism is basically I withhold judgment on the God question, but they're saying, well, you lack belief in God, therefore you're an atheist, and and it's a way to inflate their numbers and 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 to to conflate things in debates and yeah. stuff. Yeah. In Alistair McGrath, in his book, uh, Ath oh, I forgot what it's called, uh, his book on atheism, um, he goes into this, like, uh, in the 1960s and 70s, atheists started to conflate the idea, if you merely lack a belief, you're qualified as an atheist. And used, it used to be the historic definition was the belief that God does not exist. So there, there are a whole bunch of different definitions from what, I, what I'm hearing you say, and I, I agree, I, that's what I've seen. Is that, you know, there's different ways that they de define themselves, and, and I think they're changing those based on whatever little area of, of you know, community they, <laughs> they want to belong to. So well, that's what I've seen. The, I think they changed the definition because of the resurgence of Christian philosophy and the dominance uh, that we've had on these arguments for the existence of God or mm -hmm. for a worldview or for the the necessity of a transcendent reality that binds all the particular things in reality together into a cohesive whole. Yeah. Um, it's really a, a retreat uh, to sophistry and, and word games on their part. Well, I, I would say that the reason why some of them call themselves lack of belief atheists is because, um, and actually I would, I would highly encourage anyone to go watch Steve McRae in action on, on either Twitter or his YouTube because he gets in a lot of battles about this kind of thing. But the, the lack of belief thing I think is because of a burden of proof issue. So if you say you just lack the belief, then the person who has the belief has the burden of proof uh, to show that God exists. Um, that's, that's my take, but I could be wrong. Yeah, yeah and, and and that's and and it, it's a it's a sophistry, right? That that it's it's claiming that they're like a defense attorney in in a criminal trial, as opposed to to an equal part of the debate. Yeah, and it's only when you get to the um, you know the internet infidel type atheist, uh, the Twitter atheist that that define it as a mere lack of belief. When you dialogue with a professional atheist, they know full well it is the positive view that God does not exist. So they, the pro professional atheists, that uh, academic atheists that have PhDs and that teach at universities, they actually adhere to the historical definition. It's only uh, in the 70s, uh, the 60s and 70s, where these amateur and professional atheists that really have an agenda against God want to bolster their their numbers and, and try to redefine the, the debate. Yeah, I think it's a, a real tacit admission that we have won. We have largely won the argument. Um, and now we just have to, you know, keep pushing along and keep, you know, formulating our arguments in more sophisticated and better ways yeah, as time let me goes on. Yeah, I, I agree with you. We do need to to come out with better arguments. Let me ask you this. I'm gonna I'm gonna twist this up just a little bit. But what do you think about when you see two Christians who have differing perspectives getting in debates? Because C.S. Lewis was against that idea. He thought it, it's not a good idea to, for example, put an old Earth creationist with a young Earth creationist and have them duke it out. Uh, what do you think of that? What do you three think of that? Do you remember when we uh, interviewed Ken Samples? Yes. Ken, Ken Samples actually agrees with C.S. Lewis. He he doesn't think it per, you know promotes unity in the body of Christ, and I think that that is an issue and that is a problem. And I think that you know when they when 
you look at the the all the different religions, you know, uh, just within Christianity itself. I mean, uh, the different, uh, you know, there's Mormons. There's oh, Mormons aren't even Christian, but <laughs> there's all these different types of you know beliefs, and I think that it it kind of tends to break things down a little bit. But I, I also feel like there needs to be a forum for that. So so I think, you know, it's it's interesting for me to hear an old earth and a young earth creationist talk. But if it causes people to, you know, chuck all of Christianity because of it, and if they say, well, gosh, you guys can't agree on anything, you know, I'm not going to believe this, then then I see that I see C.S. Lewis and Ken Sample's point. It's like, well, maybe there's a place for that, but I don't know if it's it's a good idea to have that, you know, be so argumentative to people that aren't even believers maybe they'll they'll you know they won't even embrace christianity because of it but i don't know well uh, i'll be very pragmatic and say that the, the there is a progressive cultural consensus in the united states uh which is very powerful and has captured uh the, basically all of the Ivy League institutions and um, government offices in the United States. And they're very good at creating coalitions between people that are only have mild connections in what they want. And it seems to me in, in modern America that, that we Christians are really bad at making a uh, the, the, the same type of alliance of people that agree much, much stronger than progressives agree. Um, and so I, I think that there's a point that we have to think about what are we trying to do in articulation to the, to the greater culture versus what are we doing just because, you know, we're playing a parlor game or having an interesting discussion in, in our, uh, in, in, at coffee hour, so to speak. Josh, what do you think? Well, I, I would have to agree with Andrew. Um, you know, recently I've also, um, and, and this is largely because of all the things I've read throughout my life and because of my good friend, Andrew, I've, I've been driven to a high, high church Anglicanism. What this, uh, what C.S. Lewis has called uh, in his book, Mere Christianity, where it unites all of us together. So I think we should really combine our forces um, against the secular outslot against common sense. So that's, that's my view. Yeah, I like, you know, C.S. Lewis was very, very clever because he took his book, Mere Christianity, and he had people of all different Catholic sects, I mean, Christian sects, I should say, uh, groups read it. And he had he had Catholics look at it, Baptists look at it, Methodists look, you know, and so he had all of these different people with different perspectives look at his book uh, so he could tweak it so it wouldn't basically be catering to a single perspective, which I thought was yeah. pretty amazing. Um, and let me just add this. I was going to add this a while ago. Um, we have C.S. Lewis as far, as far as Christianity. We have C.S. Lewis, William Lane Craig, uh, Alvin Plantinga. They have Dan Barker um, in Rationality Rules. I, I look. <laughs> yeah, you pick those I, I'm two. I'm placing my bets on the Christian side. Actually, that that probably brings us to who do you think are the most influential? If you had to name, say, three top Christian apologists, and obviously I'll just I'm just going to put C.S. Lewis on the table as one of them. So let's go ahead and add three besides C.S. Lewis, because we know that he is a, a major game changer in Christianity. Uh, three that each of you think would be the ones that that you would recommend to your our atheist or our uh, weak Christian friends. I love Robbie Ra Zacharias. He was actually the first person that I started listening to um, regarding apologetics before I even got into it. So Robbie would be up there. And then of course I went to Biola University. So I have to plug Sean McDowell because <laughs> Sean was my teacher and he's just a really nice guy and he knows his stuff and he, and he has a real good sense of people. Like he just, he's very um, understanding and he doesn't, he doesn't demean the other side. And I like that about him. He doesn't try to, to make uh you know like he he actually went on youtube and uh talked with uh, the friendly atheist that guy i forget his name but he has a, a youtube channel and so so sean and the friendly atheist had this debate and they just really did a great job it was very um you know very kind and very respectful of each side and i think that that's really important in apologetics i, I think that 
you know, we need to remember to be um, friendly in, in all of this and, and, you know, open to listening to the other side for sure. Yeah, I didn't know Sean McDowell did that. I, I'll, I'll say that I, I, he's also one of my favorites. And yeah. Ravi Zacharias, I, I like him too. I like Ravi, what I like about him is he brings in the Indian perspective and coming yeah. from a Hindu population. Um, so, so he brings that in and he always has good stories from when he travels around the world, so. Yes. Um, I, I think just real briefly, other than C.S. Lewis, I would pick, um, um, I hope they're, you know, I hope living isn't a qualification. Uh, Thomas Reed. Um, N.T. Wright and William Lane Craig. Those would be my three. There, I'm just going to say in the audience, there's a few people noting that Tom Jump and Tom Jump's chair are their favorite atheists. <laughs> so, um, going back, Andrew, what do you want to do? You want to share which which uh, you'd recommend? Sure. Um, so, um, I would recommend C. Stephen Evans. Uh, who uh, has some great books called Natural Science and Knowledge of God, a new look at theistic arguments, uh, God and Moral Obligations, and then Faith Beyond Reason. Uh, so he would be one that I would uh, highly recommend. Then I would also recommend um, Alvin Plantinga, of course, with Warranted Christian Belief and his work on epistemology. Um, and then uh, J. Warner Wallace, who does Cold Case Christianity and looks at it from a historical perspective. So those are uh, the three that I choose. Yeah, I want to give one more. Great. I want to give one more. Uh, um, and this man has really influenced me. Other than Nancy Percy, uh, she's influenced me. But um, Norman Geisler has really influenced me and has been a real big part of my um, apologetics life. That's wonderful. You know, I'm, I want to throw it out there. I have interviewed quite a few really influential people on my channel. So I, I highly encourage you to, like Lisa and I just interviewed Ken Samples not too long ago. We've interviewed, uh, and Josh and I have interviewed people like Nancy Piercy. And so so there's a, we've got a, a lot of really great authors here on this channel. If you want to hear what they have to yeah. say, Lydia McGrew, the, I'm hoping to interview her husband, Tim McGrew. Uh, mm -hmm. That would be pretty awesome. And I'm right now reading Joel Edmund Anderson's book on some of the history of Christianity and it's fascinating. And so I'll throw that bone out there for him too. <laughs> I certainly would, would, uh, because we, we plan on at red pill to uh, interview, um, uh, Tim McGrew also on miracles. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I really love, we, we live in a time and day, uh, where we can interview these top scholars and exchange and, really help each other and it's a great time to be a christian we can look at the evidence and we can even grow and get better and formulate the arguments in, in an even higher a more sophisticated way and i, I just really thank all of y'all for uh for us doing this and working together I, I want to, Utopia Buster is mentioning something that, and William Lane Craig, of course, I should say that I think he's probably the number one debater on, uh, and I don't think he's lost. Now, I could be wrong. Maybe he thought he was weak in one, he actually was in a debate where he said he was weak in some other debate, and then he went back and debated that person so he can make up for that. But I haven't seen a case where I think he's weak in a debate. I mean, he is an, he's an absolute, uh, as, as two atheists have pointed out to him, he puts the fear of God in atheists. <laughs> So Christopher Hitchens and uh, uh, Lawrence Krauss both said that. Um, Inspiring Philosophy is another great channel that I would highly recommend people look at. He's, he's pretty fascinating. And uh, oh yeah, and Brian Stevens says, can we all vote for William Lane Craig to debate Matt Dillahunty? Please, please, please. <laughs> Actually, I would love to debate Matt Dillahunty first. Yeah, did any of you see the Jordan Peterson debate with uh, Matt Dillahunty? I saw parts I of it, yeah. Yep. So who, who do you, oh, Sam Harris said that, Utopia Buster saying, to, so Sam Harris, that's right, he did say that. Um, who do you think is the biggest current living challenge as an atheist? Now, I know you've mentioned Graham Oppie, Josh, and you've, I know you've debated <clears throat> Graham Oppie. So if we, if we pick the, out of the, if we look at, say, Graham Oppie, and I'm not terribly familiar with him, but also look at the four horsemen 
uh, although one of them has passed. But uh, yeah. but if we look at people like Sam Harris, uh, yeah. Lawrence Krauss, Richard Dawkins, uh, well, Richard Carrier, who do you think is a, a threat um, or the one that is uh, most intellectually robust, if you want to call it that? Well, um, I'm doing a lot of studying for for Graham Oppie the second time. Either Graham Oppie, wait, wait, by the way, I would pick way above the, the four uh, horsemen. Um, so Graham Oppie or uh, Dr. Quentin Smith at Boston University. Um, and I've, re I've reached out to uh, Quentin Smith, haven't heard back, but I will be dialoguing a second time with Graham Oppie in August. Okay, Lisa, what do you think? Um, I think Sam Harris for the popular more than, you know, I mean, I don't necessarily think uh, intellectually, intellectually as robust as maybe some of these other guys you're mentioning, but I think Sam Harris has, uh, he's very charismatic. He's funny. He's, you know, he's quick witted. And I've, I've seen, you know, him interact with the audience and audiences love him. So I think that he has that advantage because he's just, he's funny. <laughs> so, you know, people like that, you know, and, and, I've seen him uh, debate William Lane Craig, and I think William Lane Craig had better answers. They were more intellectually sound, but Sam got the audience. He got the audience because he was able to engage with them and make them laugh. And unfortunately, a lot of people nowadays don't, they're not using critical thinking skills. They don't even know how to use those. So some of these more intellectually robust dis discussions don't work on the populace. They don't care. They're, they're, they're very much feelings based. And so if some guy's funnier, they're going to go with that guy, you know? You know, that brings up a really good point. I, I listened to Mike Winger, and I would recommend him too. Um, but I listened to Mike Winger in, in his uh, debate, and I thought a lot of his arguments were pretty high level. And the, the population is, just as you know, it, there's this idea of heuristics. People need cognitive shortcuts. And so that's why when we went back to the OJ trial, uh, the winners were the defense lawyers because they came up with this simple little thing. If the glove doesn't fit, you must acquit. And they could people could grasp onto that and remember it. So we need to remember that also when we're in these these conversations that we should try to come up with our own uh, sort of slogans or mottos or, or ways that people can quickly grasp some of the things that we have. Yeah, um, absolutely. Frank Turek does a fan fantastic job doing that, by the way. Frank Turek is a really good at doing that. Yes. Yeah. And a lot of people are saying they like Cosmic Skeptic. Are you familiar with Cosmic Skeptic? Yes, I've challenged him to a debate. Okay, so so what else would you like to talk about? If the if the audience wants to ask another questions, there's a bunch of people who are in here now. So I want to thank everybody for for showing up. What else haven't we discussed today that e either any of you would like to discuss? Um, I I just want to say I I think it matters um, a lot um, about what we do um, about what God means to us. Um, you know, why it's important today to be a, to hold to belief in God or to be a Christian. I think it, it's important today because, and I, I think we went over this a little bit at, at the first, because it, it keeps you grounded. It keeps you grounded to common sense principles. You know, how we've been influenced by our history that's been influenced by a Christian understanding of reality and of ethics and so forth and not into, you know, alternative sexual lifestyles or utilitarianism, or it, it keeps you grounded in a common sense realism viewpoint. Uh, that's why I think God needs to be taught. If, if we're going to preserve our republic, and this is what our founders thought also, that our republic was so fragile that if it wasn't based on virtue, and if, it, if each generation didn't hold firmly to belief in God in a, a broadly conceived Judeo-Christian understanding of reality, then we can lose everything. So it's important to teach our kids virtue and where we came from and properly basic beliefs like the existence of God and so forth. Good, I agree. Uh, Andrew? Yeah, just sort of riffing off of that. Uh, anything that can't go on forever won't. Um, and so militant atheism and secularism can't go on forever. And uh, 
in some sense, that makes our job easier. We just have to preserve the fullness of the faith for the next generation and realize that even though it, it looks bad at the moment, um, that that's not how God works and that after Good Friday um, comes uh, Easter Sunday. Yeah, that's good. Lisa, anything else you'd like to add? Um, I. I just think religious experience is sometimes um, underrated. <laughs> I mean, in the apologetics field particularly, I mean, there's a lot of people talking about the evidence and all these kinds of things, but I think without religious experience, without actually experiencing the presence of God, feeling the love, feeling his love for you, and having that change and transform the way you interact and, and, and live your life, I mean, to me, you know, you can have all the reasons why God exists and it's very intellectually stimulating and robust, but how do, how do you live that out? How do you live practically as a Christian, as a Christ lover, you know, and how do you, yeah. even, what does that even look like? What is, what does loving God look like? And, and I think, you know, I, I wrote a, a blog a couple of weeks ago called Holy Moments and I had, I had an atheist gal like comment on it and she's like, well, what's the functionality of that? She wanted me to functionally like, talk about the actual practical aspects of how do I experience the presence of God? <laughs> well, well, you should have, uh, you should have sent her to me and the high church gang. We would have given very detailed functional guidance on that. So well, that, that's really important though, because the high <laughs> church has a certain way of doing things that really meets your needs, Andrew, I think. But for me, I go to a, I go to a non-denominational church that tends to lead toward charismatic and they believe in the gifts of the spirit and they believe in, you know, God's, you know, active purposes through the spirit today. And I think that that's one of the reasons why there are different churches, even though we may believe the same things, ultimately there are different churches because I think maybe what, what meets, you know, my experience with the presence of God won't meet yours, Andrew, or maybe if you came to my church, you'd be like, wow, this is really lame. <laughs> You know, I don't know, but I think that that's why there's different churches. But I, I, I do think that that's the coolest part about being a Christian is that there are these God moments. There's these Holy Spirit moments that make you realize, wow, I'm, I'm, I'm a part of this bigger picture. You know, I'm, I'm, this is all playing out as, as a bigger picture. And I'm, I'm invited to participate in that. And to me, that's, that's one of the coolest things about it all. Yeah, I, I, I saw a couple of questions in the audience, so I don't want to, to neglect these. I wanted to, one of them is, uh, was asking about miracles, and another one was asking, what about a blind and deaf person? And so I, how would you communicate God to them? So let me just quickly say a couple things on those, because um, people need to read. There's a really interesting story of a woman called Barbara Snyder, and Barbara Snyder had MS, which was completely debilitating. She'd lost her sight. Uh, she was bedridden. She couldn't move. Her, her arms and her, I mean, her hands and her feet were crumpled up. Uh, she'd had atrophy in her legs. And suddenly she heard the words, uh, my child, get up and walk. And it was Jesus. And she, uh, she got up and walked. And her legs immediately, the, the atrophy was gone. She actually was able to walk through the house. She went to the church that night. And because she was in a wheelchair for seven years before that, she went to the church that night. And they did basically a standing ovation when they saw her walking down the aisle. They could not believe it. So that's a miracle that was documented by Lee Strobel. But also, you can see it even in the Rockway Gazette, which is the newspaper from 1981 when this actually occurred. So, um, so that that's a, a miracle. That's just one example. Uh, Lee Strobel's got an excellent book. Let me just say one quick thing with Helen Keller. Then I'm gonna unleash it on you to you guys. Um, Helen Keller. There was a, a story of Helen Keller, and someone uh, somehow communicated Christianity to her, and she said, "I always God knew. I always knew God existed. I just didn't know His name." Wow, that's powerful. So let me go back to Josh. Josh, that, sorry. That's so important. Um, yeah. You know, I could give I could give a lot of arguments against or, or for why miracles are credible, historically plausible, and so forth. I also have a personal side to this. I, I was in a, a car accident when I was a kid. I was in a coma for a month and given no hope. I was on a, a helicopter and brought back to life many different times. And, um, you know, through prayer and everything, um, I was I was brought back. I, I went out of the coma. They wanted to even donate my organs um, that 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 first night. But I am a miracle. 
I was given no hope from from many doctors and specialists in the field. Um, I wasn't even, you know, supposed to walk again. Uh, I not only walk, I have a master's degree. Um, <laughs> Good for you. you. Know, awesome. And, and this is what this everybody in my town knows what happened. Wow. If, if you, and they will say that what happened was a miracle. So, you know, people like Craig Keener, the leading New Testament scholar, documents all this in his like a, a 1500 page, two volume set, Miracles. Um, he documents that miracles are living reality and go up uh, that that still happen today. Um, we need to be mindful of the enlightenment skepticism that blankets our eyes and ears. And we can't we refuse to grasp God's presence. God is playing a part even today in many atheists. Many people that weren't believers came to believe, came to Christianity because of what God did in my life. That's awesome. Great story. Yeah, that is great. So which one, Lisa, did you want to tackle any of those questions with other miracles? And then we'll go to, to um, Andrew. Well, I, I can bring up the whole aspect and what I've heard often is why, why doesn't God do miracles for everybody. And in other words, why why was that one woman in 1981 healed? Why was Josh healed? But my my mom died of breast cancer or something. You know, I mean, so so these are the these are the questions that I think leave us one wondering. You know, I mean, there. I, I believe I believe in God's innate goodness, and I believe because of that that I have I can trust. There's reasons that I don't understand yet, and maybe He'll show me someday. Or maybe not not the side of heaven. I don't know, but I, I think that that is a really difficult part because miracle stories are super fun and I love them. But I also recognize there's you know, some people prayed for something and it didn't happen, and that's and they lost their faith because of it, you know. And so I think that that's you know that's an element too. And I and these are the kinds of things that I, as a Christian I could just say you know I I don't know the reasons why you know why God heals some and why He doesn't others. I don't know. Yeah, and, and sort of riffing off of that, and and uh, I guess I have a another weird perspective, but you know, I I go witness a miracle every Sunday when when I participate in the sacraments, and that that there there's this deep presence of God for the Christian that that makes some some th this sort of a secondary question, right? That that in the end we are all going to be resurrected with um, uh, sanctified bodies and and God of course is going to give us a foretaste of that both in in the Gospels and in our own lives and he does wonderful things and uh, for us but the fact that that this happens now or, or happens later uh, is sort of an aspect of trust. We have to trust that God is going to fulfill his promises in Christ Jesus. Right. And that the, 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 the fact is, even though those people are healed, uh, it's likely that they will face physical death just like everyone else. And that, that the final healing will be fulfilled uh, in the new earth or, or heaven or however you want to put it. And that, that these are just previews or foretaste uh, of what's to come. You know, I happen to Yeah, that's great. And I happen to know a gal at my church. She has MS really terribly. And she's in a wheelchair. And she's had MS for, oh, gosh, at least 30 or 40 years. She's an older gal. And she has honored God in her suffering. And I, I am amazed by her because she has never, you know, chucked God because he hasn't healed her. She's been, you know very incapacitated and like what you were saying Andrew this the hope that we have uh, is that that this body that we live in right now won't be our you know the body we live in forever I mean God will do these things for us and and the, that's the hope that Christianity has versus other religions or, or or atheism is that you know you will get a new body you will have that coming to you uh, maybe this side of heaven like that 1981 woman who got healed or maybe not. Um, but that there's that hope and that's that's what keeps this this one friend of mine that's what keeps her going 
is that she knows that, you know, when she, if she doesn't get healed this side of heaven, she will on the next. And that there's another really good story. Joni Erickson Tata, you guys know her, right? Oh yeah. yeah. She, you know, 17 years old. Yeah. And, and, and what, what did she do with her suffering? She chose, she tried to go to healers for, I mean, I don't know if you guys read her book, but she tried to go to healers and get healed and pray and, and it, you know, disappointment after disappointment after disappointment, it never happened. So she finally just said, you know what, it's not going to happen. And, and instead of rejecting God and saying, you know, I'm done, she's like, well, what, what does God want to do through me in this suffering? And now she has a worldwide ministry taking wheelchairs to places like India and other places that look at people with ailments and won't touch them because they, they're, they're considered untouchable because this was bad karma. And that's why they're, you know, they're not able to walk and they won't even help these people. And so she goes into these, these areas and she brings wheelchairs and, and, and gives, gives these people, you know, validity. It's like she, she validates their, their humanness. And I think, wow, you know, I mean, what, what a great way to use your suffering for the glory of God, you know? And, and I, I honor a person like that. I'm like, wow, mm -hmm. you know, that's amazing. She, she puts us all to shame. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> so amazing. And, and see, let me story. just say that God can do things um, and, and really bring a person spiritually because of suffering. Yeah. I wouldn't have it any other way. Before my accident, I was the smartest and I was the best athlete, just mm -hmm. like my brother's. I was a, 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 I get a, a baseball star. I've had to learn everything. I'm not the baseball star anymore, but you know, I, I pushed myself and it, it's, it's God that got me through it. Mm -hmm. And it, and my accident brought people to God. There are reasons for suffering. We can grow in that. So I'm not buying the problem of evil and suffering, the short sightedness of the skeptic. Uh, it, a moment reflection, there, there's all other types of arguments and things you have to consider. I think God has a purpose for my life. And, and the atheist who sees that the problem of evil is uh, somehow plausible, take a breath and do some research. And I, I think you'll see that God can have an, an answer to the problem of evil. Let, let me ask you, uh, my, sorry for my dog barking, but, but I have a question here in the audience and I wanted to, and I know where the question's coming from because I saw another comment in the audience. So uh, one of the things that, that a lot of people talk about is the Templeton prayer study. And in the Templeton prayer study, the prayers didn't work. And it should be mentioned that the people who were doing the praying in the Templeton prayer study actually didn't even believe that the prayers would work because they came from some sort of a strange uh, non-Christian sect that that basically has these beliefs that that sort of saying that prayers don't work. So uh, there are other prayer studies where the prayers have worked, but in all of these studies, I can point out something very clear is that uh, you can't, when they do these studies, they conduct them in hospitals. And I can say you can't control for the prayers in the control group uh, from the loved ones of people in the control group. So, so if someone's having operations, you're usually praying for them and they can't stop that. So it's hard to distinguish the control group from the, the sample group. Um, but Brian wants to know if we, if we uh, Brian Stevens is asking, would you rather go to a doctor or have someone say a prayer for you? Which one would you count on? Oh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's the Christian answer, right? The best would be to go to a doctor who would pray for me. Amen. <laughs> yeah, that's what I would choose too, Brian. We, instead of, you know, giving enlightenment answers, we, why don't we take a step back and, and use common sense? Well, one, one of my favorite stories in the Bible is when Jesus spit into mud and he made mud, and he put it on the blind man's eyes, and the guy sees. And I was I was like, what the heck? You know, why is he using mud to put on this guy's eyes, right? But I think it's it's symbolic of the things of the earth and the power of prayer. So he took the things of the earth, right, and then he prayed for the for the man to see. So I don't think it's an either or. It should never be an either or thing. I think medicine and and the things that have you know come into existence through our 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 knowledge and our, our, you know, science. I mean, science is great, right? Uh, and what, why was science, why, how did science come about and why did medicine come about? It came about thinking people were, born, were, were made in the image of God and therefore worth uh, a person's life and body were worth preserving. 
Right. So this is all of this is within a Christian context. You need to step back to, uh, and look at the overall broad context of mm-hmm. this, Brian. Right. Well, yes. and the and the, and the other thing that I'll say is uh, that God loves uh, what's called secondary causation, um, and that is our participation in the creation and redemption of the world directly, and and in some sense, uh, prayer and action are both direct intercessions, right? Oh. So to, to, to use a biblical example, the Virgin Mary didn't just pray to God for, for the salvation of the world. She she took action in, in being uh, the mother of Christ to bring that forth and, and acted in congruence with God's plan. Um, and that this, mis- this is a very primitive and pagan way of looking at prayer as though it's a negotiation with a spiritual force to do something for you rather than one of the things that we do to cooperate with God. I, I love that aspect because I think Amen. that you're right because we, we look at it, God is like, you know, some sort of, you know, genie in the bottle. <laughs> you know, if you rub that bottle and, you know, you say a certain prayer a certain way, you know, that it's not about that. It's, it's God doing things with us, Emmanuel, God with us. Yeah, and and why would God operate in a a regular, uh, a repeatable, regular manner right. in a controlled experiment? God, through His middle knowledge, selects uh, or decides which person should be healed ultimately, which miracle, which prayer should be answered. God always has the the um, the answer. Um, the the best reason for the best possible state of affairs with the most people being saved in the end. So I think it's very prejudice um, pre um, uh, of us to say that God couldn't have uh, a morally sufficient reasons for allowing or disallowing certain prayers. Yeah, that's true. Well, let me let me go ahead and because we're getting really close to going on an hour and forty five minutes, so I think it might be a good idea to to close here and and yeah. have each of you maybe make a couple of final comments and and let us know how we can find you. And I need to actually put all of your uh, addresses down into the comment section here, but uh, maybe start with Lisa. Well, thank you, SJ, for having me on your show. For one thing, I I, I think you're terrific. I really do. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I feel the same about all three of you. <laughs> I just, I love your heart for the truth, and I love your respect for other people. And that you know, I mean, I love the fact that a lot of atheists actually do follow you because you know, I think you're you're non-judgmental. You're you're trying to be open. You're trying to look at all all aspects of this thing. So, so, anyways, I just wanted to say that. But yeah, I you can find me at thinkdivinely.com or womenandapologetics.com. Um, and the only thing I have to say is, you know. All y'all out there, there's a reason why you're here. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. That That's actually, you know, that's one of the things that studies have indicated is that everyone has this inner desire for meaning. And I think that that itself is is support for God. Yeah. Um, my name is Josh, and you can find me on Red Pill Religion. Um, you can contact me on uh, Twitter uh, at uh, Apologist Supreme. And um, yeah, you can just see me on Red Pill Religion and on SJ's channel. We love to do interviews. Um, we love to do debates and you can contact us there. Red Pill Religion. Hey, Josh. Yes. D- do we ever get to see your real face though? <laughs> uh, maybe you can. <laughs> he, he showed it before, <laughs> right before you got on. Well, thanks again for having uh, us on for such a wonderful discussion, SJ. Um, I look forward to discussing economics with you sometime. Um, but uh, I'm the same place Josh is, Josh is on uh, redpillreligion.com. And you can find me as at astratalities um, on twitter.com. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you so much. And, and you can find me on Twitter at LEAD1225. And uh, you can find me also at Christian-Apologist.com. I love writing blogs. And I've written over 100 blogs in support of Jesus and Christianity. And I just keep going. I can't stop because I, I am so excited about this and trying to communicate the word to everybody um, that, that it's, it's just he's transformed my life. And I want him to 
uh, I want other people to have that same experience. And I've so thank you, everyone. I've written over three blogs. So. <laughs> well, I need. I want to write a book. That's my next thing. I'll at some point write a book. But I. But I want to have actually have a publisher. So I'm. I'm waiting. So, um, but anyway, thank you so much, everyone. Thank right. you for coming thank you. on. Thank you, everybody. In the